So today we're joined by Parth. Parth is a ex-Twitter software engineer, um, and we were actually interns together uh, in 2019 at uh, Twitter. Um, and so we're going to be doing a mock interview question today. So Parth, uh, hopefully you're ready to uh, kind of start with things. I'm excited to start. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, perfect. Uh, so we're going to get into the problem. So in this problem, uh, you're going to be given reference to the root of a binary tree. And you're also going to be given two other integer values. You're going to be given uh, integer value x, which is the value of the node that you're kind of going to be searching for. Um, and then you're also going to be given a value k, uh, which is going to be a distance factor we want to calculate from this given node uh, with integer value x. So you're not going to be given actual reference to the node. Um, you're going to be given the integer value. And then, okay, we just need to find that within the tree structure and then do a certain computation. And so the idea <clears throat> is, let's say you are given a k of two and an x of three. Let's imagine that all these integer values are unique. Um, so this x of three means we're dealing with this node right here. And there's this k value of two. So what does this k value indicate? Uh, the idea is we want to find all nodes that are two hops in the upwards direction or any other direction from this given node. Um, so it's kind of a straightforward, kind of visually we can see what's going on here. Uh, we want to, we have this three here, and this one is one hop, um, and then this two is two hops. So this two is going to be one of the nodes that we want to return. Uh, we're going to return either the value or reference. In this case, I think we're dealing with value. Got it. And so that is this K value. So the two is actually the only node that is uh, two hops away. So. Uh, you okay. know, it's three hops up to the root and then down here, this four and the six are one hop away. So in this example we have down here, we say how many nodes are one hops uh, away from this uh, node with a value three. It's the same node as the first example. And while it's the it's the root, it's the value right above the three. So we hop from the three mm -hmm. up to the one and then we do one hop down. So the three has the four below it and then the six below it. So we're kind of doing Got a it. radius here uh, away from like the root node or the, the node that uh, X deals with. So that was kind of the Got description. It. Okay. Um, it's a bit, uh, it's fairly straightforward to think about. Uh, you, you can ask me any questions you have about this problem and we can kind of hop into things. Cool, sounds good. So I think- um... If you're enjoying this video, we have plenty more awesome data structure algorithm and system design explanations on interviewpen.com. You can ask us any questions you have about any kind of topics surrounding data structures and algorithms and system design. We release two to four videos a week. You can run your code. You can talk to a personalized AI teaching assistant. And yeah, the site's pretty great. Anyway, enjoy the video. I think my first question, just wanted to clarify, is the idea of unique values here because you mentioned that we don't have the reference to the actual node. We are given the integer value x. So can I assume for certain that every single tree object that I'll get will have node values that are all unique so that one value for a target corresponds to a single node in that tree? Is that Yeah. So it, yeah, exactly. You can assume all of these values are unique. Uh, the, the kind of core of the problem is uh, how you kind of deal with this core structure. Um, we're not necessarily mm -hmm. worried about these like edge cases. Um, let's assume all integer values are unique. In other variants, we'd imagine you'd get reference. Uh, that's not really the key thing we're looking at. Um, yeah, everything's gotcha. going to be unique. Uh, yeah, good okay. question. Cool. And then I guess there also isn't any sort of minimum or maximum constraint as to how many nodes this tree can have. We can kind of extrapolate this to however many or, you know, have a null, which is basically still technically a tree, um, but just nothing. So we want to basically account for all of them, I'm assuming. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, yes, you can expect, let's say, yeah, you can expect a tree to be empty. Um, we are only going to give you a value within the tree. So that's, uh, yeah, that's a good question. We're I not going to, sense. Yeah. yeah, we won't throw you an invalid value. Um, and let's imagine okay. the tree <clears> can be a reasonable size like a thousand nodes um nothing too okay. crazy uh we still want to keep into account like asymptotically like you know how well are we doing but nothing where you're going to need to think about okay we're overflowing on memory here uh, and so on mm -hmm. okay cool um i think that makes a lot of sense uh and then i just this is just for my own kind of reminder um i like tree problems so i'm just kind of trying to think to myself so i think when it comes to binary trees um, I think the definition for the tree node is given here in Python, which is nice. So I just wanted to clarify that, you know, we have the value, we have the left pointer and the right pointer. Uh, in this case, however, with this with this problem, uh, we're kind of treating the tree kind of like a, you know, unweighted graph uh, in that a node can have a radius. So when it comes to this value of the three right here, for example, uh, I not only look at its children nodes right here, but I also want to look at its parent node over here. And I, I just wanted to clarify that, that that's how we're looking at it. So if I'm looking for two hops, I can jump to its parent and then down to a child. So like a cousin node right here. Yes, uh, sibling, that, that is, uh, that, yeah, that's an accurate way uh, to kind of model cool. things and think about it. Okay, cool. I think, I mean, I think I have a 
a initial sort of idea of how I'd want to approach this. And I think, I think I'm just going to kind of like say it out loud first before we end up writing any, like maybe even like pseudo code for this or, you know, even words. Um, I like to do that sometimes, but I think my initial approach is just to think about this in terms of a, a graph problem, which I am fairly you know comfortable with. I think in general, this sounds like and sort of smells like a breadth first search problem because we are jumping or we're trying to find nodes that are k away from a specific target node and whenever it comes to sort of looking for k away breadth first search is really nifty because it allows us to actually uh process nodes away from a specific source one at a time so that's sort of what i'm thinking we're going to want to look at this from a breadth first search sort of perspective. Right. Uh, the only caveat here is that um, because it's a tree structure, we don't actually have access to parent pointers. So we're probably going to have to figure out some workaround there. Um, I don't know if that's the what the problem like truly wants from us, but I think that's probably how I'm going to approach it right. is, you know, kind of uh, either we can use a map here to like map some parent pointers, or we can use um, I think Python's pretty nice, actually, and it allows us to just define instance variables on the fly. So maybe we can just do that as well. Um, and I'll show you what I mean when I start coding this. But right. I think what I wanted to start with doing first is just sort of kind of writing out, uh, you know, going through the examples in our case and, and sort of just writing out the steps in terms of what we want to do and how you want to approach this. So right. first things first, um, I think you mentioned uh, that we don't actually have access to the node itself. So I think first things first, we can probably write some sort of a pre-order traversal. Actually, you know what? The pre-order traversal or just any kind of tree traversal will work in this case, but I'm just going to do pre-order because it's uh, nice. Okay. But I feel like in the pre-order traversal, let's do one thing. Let's first of all, identify the node. Like let's find it. And then once we find it, let's also define the parent pointers for every node while we're doing it. So right. I guess the idea is like step one, um, find node. So find node with value uh, X. Uh, and I guess um, you could use a map. I'm just going to probably define them in the node itself and store right. parent uh, parent pointers for each node. And I guess in our case, let's do this using reorder. Um, anyone would work, uh, post order works, in order right. works. <clears throat> yeah. They're all kind of, arbitrary in this case. But so yeah, we'll run that pre reversal. And once we do that, now we have access to all the nodes. Uh, and then in that case, um, let's, what we'll do is we'll initialize our BFS. So we'll initialize a queue uh, with, and because BFS uses a queue and then processes from left to right. And so we'll initialize a queue with just the target node uh, and a distance of zero. We'll kind of store that, I guess, in a tuple, somehow tuple. Um, right. And then what we can do is we can uh, carry out the BFS and essentially our terminating condition. So, uh, or not terminate, but like in, um, in our case, I mean like when we add it to our, our list of outputs. Uh, so add to output, oops, uh, when the distance equals, equals K. So I think that, should be good um and, right. and and again by the way what one thing i forgot to mention is that when we do carry out the bfs um uh i just wanted to mention what the what the neighbors are in this case uh for the bfs uh neighbors for a node include left right and parent nodes so that's kind of a a little I guess, caveat for us, because now we know that when we do that traversal, we're also looking up and then we include that in our distance. So right. yeah, I think that's, I think that's sort of how I'm looking at it now. Does that sound kind of like a, a valid approach to you? Any tweaks that you think we should make there? Yeah, no, I think uh, the way you're approaching things and modeling the problem is uh, kind of the direction we want to go. Um, all this makes sense. Okay. Uh, yeah. Do the traversal, find the value, store parent pointers. Um, yeah, using a queue for the breadth for search. Uh, yeah, I think you're on a very solid uh, path. And uh, yeah, I think you can uh, proceed. Cool. Um, awesome. So let's take a look. Um, so just in this case, this is the function we want to implement. I'm going to go ahead and take this out. Um, okay, so what do I want to do first? Step one, find node with the value x. Cool. So what I will do is I will say, I'll, I'll define a target node object or just a value right here and I'll set it to none for now. Um, and I will define a, oh, the indentation is kind of weird in this, but okay. I'll define a, a helper function within our function. We can change that. I just, it's kind of a little pattern I like to follow, but we'll define a three order function here um, that essentially takes in a certain node. And we're going to start with our root, obviously. Uh, and then we also uh, 
feed in a parent reference. Uh, and the reason I do that is because I, as I carry out my pre-order, I want to keep track of the parent. And if I just feed that into the function, it's it makes things easy. Um, so I'm just going to set the default to none because I'm going to run it on the root and the root has no parent. So what we want to do here, also, I'm just going to put a pass at the end so we don't see like red lines. Um, sure. Anyway, so for this one, we want to check First of all, if we don't have a node, so if we're on a on a leaf node and we're traversing its left and right, which are going to be none, we don't want to do anything. So I'll just say if not node uh, return here. That's our sort of uh, terminating case in this in this sort of pre-order traversal. And then right. simply uh, we can just recursively call on the left and right. So what we'll do is we'll do pre-order on node dot left uh, comma, and the parent in this case is going to be node. And then we'll run pre-order on node.write and we're going to set node again. Um, one thing I forgot to do here is that keep in mind, we want to um, check two things. We want to find that node, first of all. Right. So we want to say, first things first, if node.val, if that's equal to the value of X, right? Uh, we know that we found that node, so we can set target node to that, uh, like that. And that's one thing right there. And then we also, we might run into scope issues there. I hope we don't, but I need to remind myself of how that works. Okay, that's one thing. And then also we want to store the parent pointers. So we're going to go ahead and do that right here. We'll say uh, node.parent equals um, parent. So yeah, Python 3 allows us to do that. We can actually define these, uh, but simply enough, you could also just do something like this. You could create a map and then just do parent of that equals node. Um, either way, it doesn't really matter. I'm just going to go with this node.parent just because it's a little cleaner, um, but... We can do both ways. Uh, okay, why am I getting an issue here? Uh, local variable target node is assigned to, but never used. Uh, it's fine. We'll use it later. Um, okay, so that's that works. Uh, that defines our pre-order function. It does all the work we need to do when it comes to actually finding the node and defining its parents. Okay. Now let's call I, it. I imagine so, so the the node uh, the node dot parent. I imagine we can just add the parent property. I don't know if this will throw a runtime error. I'm not I'm not as familiar with Python. Um, yeah, no, that's fair enough. I, I honestly, I kind of agree with you. So let's just, just to be safe, let's just create a parent map and then just do this um, parent map. So what we'll would uh, kind of the mode. the space trade-off be if we did find a way to like annotate the actual nodes versus creating our you know own auxiliary structure? Um, yeah. I guess that's something that's a good to question. as well. Yeah, realistically, us using an auxiliary structure like parent map is adding space complexity of O of N because we are now storing every single reference to this node. And actually, um, Python is by reference here because the node will have a specific reference. So it technically won't really be that much more memory than us just storing an array of stuff. It's still O of N. Um, right. Whereas in the case of us uh, just storing it at the node level, we're not actually creating any technically any new um, auxiliary space. We're using the the same kind of space that was yeah. allocated for that object itself. Yeah. That's kind of why actually I didn't even think about that. But that's also another trade off as to us just defining those pointers there. Yeah, let's let's um, imagine that's so can, not a problem. Um, I I just wanted to bring it up as you know if we're operating in a very like memory constrained environment, we'd think okay, you know maybe we could use the yeah. whatever objects handed to us, but like whatever that's just a detail. I just want to bring that up for the sake of, uh, yeah, whatever. Anyway, I, yeah, you're, no. you're on a good track. Good, good point. I also think that at the end of this problem, if things work out, uh, we can go ahead and actually try that approach just, you know, and then see if it still runs because we both kind of discussed it and it does make sense as to why that would reduce space complexity. Um, so yeah, we can even try that. Um, but anyway, uh, so now we have references to every node's parent, which is great. Uh, so let's do this. Let's go call. Let's go ahead and call pre-order. Uh, and I'm gonna go ahead and call it on the root. Um, and again, we're not. I'm not gonna add the parent because it's already defaulted to none, which is great. Uh, so that's gonna basically populate. It's gonna go through the entire tree and it's gonna do what we need to do. Rely on the recursion. What I was told. So that's good. Um, now we can do these. Now we can do step two, three, and four here. So Python is nice. I think. I think it doesn't provide a queue implementation out of the box, but it does provide a DEC or DQ, double-ended queue. So I'm going to go ahead and import that. Um, is that okay if I use that? Yeah. Uh, importing any structures or doing any Googling you need to do is completely fine. Yeah. Okay, sweet. Yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and import that. Uh, so I like to use DQ. Uh, super nifty, honestly, has carried me through a bunch of interviews this one right here. Um, yeah. Let's go ahead and import from collections. 
uh, DQ, and then we will go ahead and initialize our queue here. So first things first, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna define the output array up here, uh, just because we know we want to output something at the end. Once we call pre-order, now let's call our yeah. Now we can call our queue. Um, so our queue is going to be. I kind of mentioned we want to keep track of two things. Um, so we're using the DQ object and. The two things you want to keep track of are the node that we're at, along with the um, along with the distance from the node. So, we now have a reference to target node right here. Um, and I actually do think Python's going to throw an issue here, so I'm just going to wait until we get that issue. Otherwise, sure. I, I, what I might end up doing is I might make this into an array and then got like modify the zeroth element, um, right. just to kind of because Python does that. But anyways, let's just see if it works. Uh, let's go and do, we'll create a DQ of a tuple of target node and zero. Zero being the distance from target node. And and sort of the reasoning for that makes sense, right? It's like we're at the target node, it's a distance of zero away. And then when we do the BFS, we get one more, one more, and we keep going with that. So um, cool. So that's good to me. Uh, let's go ahead. Let me think. Are we going to want to keep track of a scene set here? That is a point to consider. And I think, yeah, I think that's an interesting thing. Yes, it makes sense for us to keep track of scene because if we are looking at this tree over here, if I jump to one, right, and I'm looking at one's neighbors, one's neighbors are three and two, and right. I've already seen three. So I yes. don't want to repeat that. Okay, so cool. Let's go ahead and add that as well. Um, so we'll create a queue here. We'll create a so scene I, set. I, I just want to I just want to annotate something. That That's a good point about mm -hmm. the queue. Um, what scenario would we want to use a queue and when would we not necessarily need one? Um, the tree originally is a directed async loop graph. So it's like it has no cycles. Yeah. Um, and, and you did bring up the idea of, okay, what if we cycle back on ourselves? Now that we can go up to a parent um, and we're doing a breadth for search, there's an ability for us to kind of go back on ourselves. So we turn the graph from exactly. directed to undirected. And that's exactly what you brought up. Uh, so that's just like an exactly. annotated point on when would we need to see where we have gone um, and so on. And yes, yeah. using hashing hashing structure gives us uh, you know the ability to quickly determine that. But yeah, exactly. No, I think I think that's a great point. I think the main realization here is the fact that because we convert from a directed to an undirected structure, right. the idea of having us like go back on ourselves is very very doable. Uh, and so we want to prevent that, um, you know, because two jumps could mean that I basically put myself in that list and we don't want to do that. Right. Um, and so to prevent scenarios like that from happening, we keep this, this idea of a, you know, a hashed structure where we can keep track of what we've seen or not. Cool. So I think that makes sense. Let's keep going. Um, so now we want to conduct the actual breadth for search. So I'm just going to go ahead and say, while queue, um, just a little shorthand for while the length of queue is not none because Python allows for us to do that. Basically, Python is pseudocode. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and pop the queue. So we'll keep, we'll get the node and we'll get the distance uh, and we'll set that equal to the queue dot pop left property, I think. Yeah. And that now gives us the node and the distance. And so the first thing we want to check is, well, first things first, let's go ahead and add this node to our process set or our scene set, because now we've seen it. Um, so we'll go ahead and add this node here and we'll do a check to now see if our distance, if that distance is equal to K, right? If we're already K away now, which means that we're at a node that does fall in that property. Let's right. go ahead and, and add that to our output array. So we'll go ahead and add node.val. Um, otherwise, right, or not even otherwise, we want to keep process. We do want to keep processing once we reach that because, you know, um, there could be a potential, you know, parent node of that child or whatever that we're at that is also two away. Um, but regardless, uh, okay. let's let's go ahead and, and just carry this forward. So we're going to go ahead sure. and go through its neighbors. Uh, so we kind of talked about this. So we'll say for na I'm just going to say for neighbor in, and this is going to be a list of potential opportunities. It's going to be the node dot left, node dot right, and uh, parent map of node, right? Um, we're going to want to now actually form the BFS here and, and add this to the end of the list, but we want to do some checks here first. We don't want to add a node that doesn't exist, right? If we're already at a leaf right. node, um, node.left won't be anything. So we want to check for that. So if this exists and it's not in our scene set, um, in both those cases, we want to go ahead and now add this to our processing list. So we'll go ahead right. and uh, I think it's just a pen. Yeah. 
um, for the DQ. So we'll go ahead and append. And what are we appending? We are going to be appending the neighbor itself along with the distance plus one, because now we're one away right. from that. So that sort of the idea and, and, you know, that should basically get everything done. Um, okay. And we just want to return the output here. That's that sort of thing. So let's see, uh, we have connected pre-orders. We have the node now, we have the parents. We initialize the, the, the BFS here. We conduct it by popping it, adding to our scene set. If we are K away, then we go ahead and put that into our output array. We iterate through its neighbors, which are left, right, and parent. And we only perform the further processing if the neighbor exists and we haven't seen it. Yeah, so I think this is this should work. Um, yeah, I think I kind of just walked through that logic and it makes sense to me. The only place I think we might run into issues is this target node reassignment thing over here. Um, I don't know if Python allows for us to do that, but you know, let's go ahead and right. check. Yeah, we'll, we'll um, work it out. Yeah. Okay, sweet. Uh, so we have a test right here. So I think we can just go ahead and run it um, and then see what we expect. So yeah, let's sure. go ahead and do that. And we're printing that. So I'm just gonna go ahead and press print. Yeah, great. Okay, awesome. Um, none type object has no attribute left on line 61. Um, interesting. That's weird because why would it even get to the point where no is none, which is the which is the interesting thing, right? Because we're checking this right here. Exactly. Like how would that answer uh, the queue? Right. Exactly. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. So I guess what I'll do is let me go ahead and print um, print what we're seeing. So I'm going to go ahead and just... Uh, and just because Python's fancy, let's use if strings and we'll say, uh, um, this is literally how I debug on my job as well. So For sure. all right, we, we, we all, we all console log. <laughs> we all have the log statements everywhere. <laughs> just delete yeah, that before pod, but... Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I know what's going on. Okay. So this is actually exactly what I thought was going to be the issue. And I'm glad that was it. Um, cool. So it's because of the the fact that Python local scope wise doesn't let you reassign objects that are already assigned. It's like it has, it's weird about it. But if we use something like a pass by reference, mm -hmm. uh, like an array, uh, we can actually uh, reassign it like that. And so, um, yeah, that just makes our life a lot easier. That's fine. Uh, so yeah, very simple fix. I just changed I just changed it into an array, which is a mutable sequence, and then I just mm -hmm. uh, update the value right here. So let's go ahead and try that again. Okay. Um, yeah, this is like a little hack. Uh, probably not the best thing to do, but eh, whatever. Sure, sure. No worries. Okay, cool. So yeah, we got... Okay, so I should get rid of the print statement uh, and I'll run that again. Sure. Um, but yeah, so in the first one, we're getting two, uh, which is the expected result. In the second one, we're getting four, six, one, and yeah, yeah. same stuff. Yeah, yeah. Essentially, the order of but, the output um, isn't... It just shows that, okay, you, you have the unique nodes that we're expecting. So yeah. Exactly, exactly. I'm assuming this is probably like in sorted order or something. I don't know. But yeah, this um this looks good to me. I, I I think that was that was probably the approach I would have taken. I, I do want to try though that parent reassignment thing, just like right. using the node dot parent. Yeah. Um so if you're think, cool if you're cool with that. Yeah, I think for the sake of what we're doing, I think it's fine. Uh we we don't need to make that optimization. Um I think you've approached the problem very well. Uh, you kind of outlined your approach and, you know, we have, uh, you know, a, a working solution here. So I think, I think we're good on that. Okay. So let's think about, uh, the runtime, uh, the, uh, kind of, yeah. you know, where are we expensing time and space here? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Um, happy to do that. So I think runtime wise, let's go through it step by step. That's kind of just how I best see it. So again, the, the first big chunk of our runtime is in the pre order traversal. Um, and we know that this is going to be an O of N because we are traversing through all N nodes in our tree uh, because we need to traverse them. We're like basically processing all of them from this parent map line right here, line 46. So that's going to be an O of N operation right there. And then the actual BFS itself is also an O of N because we're going to be popping from the left and essentially processing at worst case, the entire queue um, to basically find all of the ones that are K away. So yeah, I... I so this is kind of like a you know a total of still asymptotically O of n because it's just two O of n operations chained together, so it's not too bad. It's a linear solution, um, and I guess that makes sense. There's like not really much to this problem that would be you know nonlinear, right? Um, but I'm, yeah, I, I think that makes sense to me. I'm trying to think if there's like a multiple or like if it's there's like a, a lower bound than that. Yeah, but I think because k could at most be n itself. Right, like you right. could have 
K be some absurd number, like in this case, like six or something or five, one, right. two, three, four or something, you know, you would end up processing the entire tree. So yeah. So yeah. yeah. O of N, O of N makes sense to me. Uh, so space, I'll just start writing that down right here. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, I would agree with that. Um, you know, reasonably like what is the best we could do? Um, you know, oh, well, yeah, the best would be like, okay, we just have to like do one hop and then it's kind of like, yeah, it, it's, it's just a singular operation, but yeah, the worst we could do is, okay, we have to touch the whole tree. Um, so I think, mm -hmm. yeah, in kind of the worst case, the best we can do is we're going to have to touch all the nodes because we have to, you know, reach out that far. Um, and if we were to think of this from like, okay, is because I believe BFS is a uh, big O V plus E, um, you know, how many vertices are there? You know, we're going to have N vertices, how many edges? Well, the yeah. edges are going N to be minus bounded. one. Exactly. Exactly. Edges are bounded exactly. linearly. Yeah. You have a linear amount plus a linear amount bounded linearly, but we don't need to like yeah. compartmentalize that. I was just mentioning that. Um, so no, that's good. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so yeah, I, I like how you approach things. Uh, and you know, we got to a working solution. And yeah, I think I think you did a good job with things. Let's step into the meta and kind of you could talk about, you know, how do you think you did with things? Um, how is this compared to other interviews? Um, and just uh, kind of yeah. what is your meta analysis on how uh, you kind of approach things? Yeah. <clears throat> so I think overall, this was probably a good interview. If I was interviewing the person giving this exact interview, I'd probably pass them on. Just because I feel like, um, I, to be honest though, I I do enjoy problems that are kind of about trees and graphs because it just, there's only, I think like a finite number of things you can really do with trees and graphs, which right. is kind of why I think they're fun to work with. Yeah, um, they're especially I think, tricky uh, though. You know, yeah. I, no, definitely, they're tricky. Uh, and, and they do take a, a bit of work to crystallize the problem down into an approach that you have seen before. Mm -hmm. But to be honest, I've seen so many... Uh, not to like, you know, give you more free promotion, but I've seen so many of the videos you've made and, you know, oh, and from, yeah, from that, yeah, from that, I feel like I have kind of uh, gotten a knack of like, just how to, how to identify which problem kind of calls for what solution. Right. Um, that was actually like way. amazing. Like the way you approach that, like, I don't know if you've seen this problem before because the assumption is like, okay, I just, you know, randomly choose a problem. Um, but the way you approached it yeah. was very, very nice. Like that was exactly how I would think of it. I'm like, okay, let's think about the base case. Oh, let's actually do the whole like parent rewiring as we're doing the traversal, this whole linear time, yeah. finding the node. Um, and like just the way you uh approach things was like, it was just like, okay, this is like exactly how I would imagine you would like what to do that piece. Cause it's like, there's like one yeah. way you can do a vanilla breath first search. It's like, you just do it. Like, uh, so I think you yeah. approach that stuff. Well, um, anyway, yeah, you can continue. Yeah, no, um, thank you. I think, I think one thing to kind of like talk about here is like in comparison to other interviews, I would say like, I was, this, this, this is pretty classic of like first or second technical screen level questions that I've gotten. Um, I think honestly, I probably wouldn't be surprised if I got this at like an on site too, as like an intro question. Um, but I do think that this is the kind of question that, and I also think that a lot of people, like when they do interview prep, you, you kind of have questions that, question flavors that you're happier to get and like more familiar with uh, and like other questions that you kind of dread. Like I feel like everyone kind of dreads dynamic programming or like, right. you know, just memorization, things like that. It's like, it's I'm, hard I'm to think actually, about. I'm actually amazed that dynamic programming is like even a thing in terms of like, uh, it's yeah. just kind of amazing uh, considering how academic of a concept because I have seen proofs for greedy algorithm dynamic programming problem dynamic programming problems that span like two pages like three pages mm -hmm. um like mm -hmm. it is not really something you come up with it's like algorithms people have invented uh which is intriguing to me oh, exactly um but yeah. you know no yeah that's a <laughs> it's a great point i mean i i distinctly remember like my algorithms class in college was um there was like a big focus on dynamic programming and like it, it was always about identifying the sub problems right and that's kind of where i struggled like i just I can, I, I think I can find a sub problem, but then when you ask me to write like some sort of a, um, a pseudo code kind of recursive implementation to it, I always kind of falter on that. But I think, I do think that when it comes to these problems, like exposure is your friend, the more you see them, the more you kind of like deal with problems that have looked like this in the past, I think the easier it is. Like, for example, in this one, I knew that there was going to have to be a pre-order traversal because how else would you get parent pointers? Right. Right. And it's like, that's the one thing, um, and I feel like there really isn't any other way to do this if you don't have parent pointers. Right. If this was a graph problem, it would be very simple. It would literally just be a BFS. Like mm -hmm. that's all. Yes. Um, uh, but in this case, we convert it to a graph first and then we and then we do the BFS. So just like kind of like 
thinking about problems in terms of chunking them into how do I make this simpler for myself, I think is a really common pattern to follow on these ones. Um, right. But yeah, I haven't, I mean, I haven't interviewed in like five or six months. So yeah. I'm, I'm kind of, uh, I'm, I'm kind of glad to just, you know, get back in the, in the groove of it yeah. and see that. that. That's that's a funny thing with any of these that I do. Uh, I'm always catching people at a time where they haven't interviewed probably in a year, like or two. Um, yeah. So that's a funny thing about this kind of series slash pattern. Um. Uh. So that's intriguing. Um. Okay. Uh. What yeah. else? Uh. Do you do you have any other kind of tips or any other uh kind of stuff from your interviewing experience that you want to pass on to people? Like what uh tips you would have to do well? Um. Yeah. Stuff that I specifically the... rings true to you. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a few things. I think the the number one, probably the most important thing to me is that um, I think everyone has an interviewing personality and I think it's an important thing to kind of develop um, because at the end of the day, your interviewer is also just a person who's working as a software engineer most likely and like is probably doesn't really want to do the interview. Right? That's why right. I think about it the way. And, and that's, like, that's a huge how thing. How do Sorry. I feel when someone... Sorry to interject, yeah. but no, go ahead. these like think about what a software engineer's day looks like. And this is something I didn't understand as a university student. Like, they're an engineer, yeah. like they are going through their day, they have meetings and between those meetings, they're coding or they're thinking about problems or whatever, meeting with other people. Um, an interview is yeah. not like, there's no dedicated person who is a professional interviewer. At least I don't imagine that is a thing. Um, they are, uh, you know, that that's an interesting dynamic. Uh, you just get assigned to interviews and people are like, oh, that's fun. Let me be in the interview rotation. Yeah. Um, so it's really, yeah. you know, you could be at the whim of someone who's just having a bad day. Maybe someone just shows up late. No, um, no, yeah, literally, so, literally. Yeah, I, so, and I can honestly, like, um, in the in the spirit of honesty, like, I know for a fact that I've had days where I've done interviews. I guess it's like I've conducted them, and I've just been checked out or I've been zoned out. And I'm kind of like, I'm kind of listening. I'm listening for cues, and I'm listening to see if like they're kind of getting it. But I think what really sticks with me, and I notice this for myself, and so that's why I kind of try to do the same thing with other people. I notice that when the interviewee has like a personality that I can vibe with. Like if they are talking to me in a way where it's like, oh, like they seem kind of excited about the problem, even though it's a really boring tree problem. Then I'm kind of like, okay, I'll listen to what they kind of have to say. So right. that's sort of like probably my number one, number one tip to anyone doing these interviews is like more important. I mean, obviously know how to do the problems and like, you know, right. I mean, to be honest, like even with you, you were kind of nudging me and like you always, the interviewer will always kind of nudge you in the right direction. So right. even if you don't know the problem, I think just try to try to approach it from a lens where you very clearly articulate exactly what's going through your head, but you're also doing so in a way where it's like, there is some enthusiasm, you know, you don't sound like you had a bad day. Cause if I sound like I had a bad day, then the interviewer is going to be like, okay, um, cool. Like that was, that was nothing, uh, you know, that really stood out to me at all. And they're going to go back and they're going to, first of all, forget to write your feedback. Like that always happens. Like it's always the recruiters who are after the, you know, after the interviewers to be like, Oh, can you please write feedback on the interview so we can give them next steps. Right. And then you end up writing feedback a week later and a week later, you don't even remember what the person said or did. Right. So leave an impression. That's my, that's my only thing. That's that I think I that, try to do that. Yeah. Just leave an impression. I'm sure you've seen the same thing, right? Like you've done interviews, Benjamin, like you know for a fact that it comes down to, a large part of it comes down to, can they clearly articulate their thoughts? Even though they didn't get the problem, were they right. able to at least go to a point where it would have been like one or two more lines of code, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. That's the way I see it, so. No, yeah, that, that, that's a great insight. That's a great insight. So that was the interview. Uh, if you want to go practice this problem in full, you can go to interviewpen.com. We have a ton of great video explanations and you can code along to problems. We publish two to four videos a week in data structures and algorithms and system design. Uh, so yeah, you can go practice there. Um, and we want to thank Parth for his time and thank you for watching. Of course, thank you for having me.